Rome and Carthage had been rivals for centuries. When the contradictions between them became insoluble, the wars started. In history, they are known as Punic Wars. At the time, the Second Punic War was called Hannibal's War, after the Carthaginian general, Hannibal Barca. The First Punic War was victorious for Rome. Carthage lost Sicily and was forced to pay large reparations. This caused the economic collapse in Carthage and led to a mercenary revolt which quickly became a full-scale war. Rome used this opportunity to annex Corsica and Sardinia, previously controlled by Carthage. But even after such setbacks, the Carthaginians were able to compete with Rome very soon. They conquered new lands in northern Africa and on the Pyrenean Peninsula. Silver mines in the new lands, as well as huge maritime trade and revenue, allowed Carthage to quickly regain power. In 221 BC, Hannibal became a new commander-in-chief of the Carthaginian armed forces in Spain. When he was just nine years old, he swore to his father that he would be an eternal enemy of Rome, and he kept his oath till his final breath. He began extending the Carthaginian lands in Spain. Rome and Carthage had an agreement about the separation of the spheres of influence by the Ebro River, so the Romans, in theory, were not supposed to complain about Carthaginian expansion. But nevertheless, they were concerned about the Punic advances on the Pyrenean Peninsula. To restrict Carthage's influence, Rome signed alliance treaties with a number of city-states in Spain. One of such city-states was a Greek colony, Saguntum. Hannibal was looking for a pretext to start a new war against Rome. He provoked a conflict between Saguntum and Iberian tribes and sided with the Iberians right away. The Romans at this time were busy dealing with Gauls and Illyrian pirates and didn't have the means to support their ally. Instead of an army, they sent ambassadors who demanded from Hannibal to stop the siege immediately. Hannibal rejected these demands, attacked the city and took it after a prolonged siege. After that, Rome did not have another choice but to declare war on Carthage. The Second Punic War started with a series of Hannibal's successes. He quickly crossed the Alps and reached Italy. For the Romans, it was completely unexpected. The news about the Punic army in the north of Italy shocked the Romans. They tried to stop Hannibal's advance, but had no luck. In three successive battles, Hannibal destroyed the Roman armies. First, at the Ticino River, he crushed the army led by consul Publius Cornelius Scipio. Later, at the Trebia, Hannibal defeated the army of the second consul, Tiberius Sempronius Langinus. And soon after that, at the Lake Trasimeno, he also defeated the forces of a newly elected consul, Gaius Flaminius. The road to Rome was now open, but the key part of the Hannibal's plan failed. He expected that Rome would be abandoned by its allies, first and foremost by Etruscans and Italic tribes, who were just recently conquered by Rome. But that didn't happen. Only Gauls from Cisalpine Gaul joined Hannibal's army. All the other allies remained faithful to Rome. With their help, even after such crushing defeats, Rome was able to quickly rebuild the army. Hannibal needed an even more impressive victory to make Italic people part ways with Rome. Being in a desperate situation, the Romans elected a dictator and tasked him to stand against Hannibal. His name was Quintus Fabius Maximus. He understood that the Roman army was not capable of fighting against Hannibal in an open battle. That's why he employed guerrilla warfare determined to exhaust the enemy army. The Romans attacked the Carthaginian foragers and logistic roads, set up ambushes and blocked strategic mountain passes. At the same time, the Romans avoided any attempts of the Carthaginians to engage them in a decisive battle. This strategy was named after him Fabian strategy. Such skirmishes lasted for almost a year. Hannibal was not able to convert his military victories into political success. His army suffered from annoying guerrilla attacks and did not have reliable supply lines. So Hannibal led his army to the south of Italy. He counted on finding new allies there, among some neat tribes who recently fought fierce wars against Rome, and also hoped to find food supplies in the fertile Campanian and Apulian lands. At the same time, 
dissatisfaction with the tactics chosen by the dictator grew in Rome. Guerrilla warfare was highly unpopular amongst the Romans. People deemed this war dishonorable and demanded to give Hannibal the decisive battle. In 216 BC the dictatorship was cancelled and two consuls were elected – Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Gaius Terentius Varro. The Romans raised a huge army. The Roman legion normally consisted of 4,000 Roman infantrymen, the same or slightly higher number of allied infantry, and a few hundreds of allied cavalrymen. But for a decisive battle, the Romans first decided to strengthen their legions by adding a thousand of both Roman and allied infantry, and second, they decided to field a much bigger army than ever before. Usually the Romans fielded armies of two or four legions, but this time they fielded an army of eight strengthened legions. Though their army size almost reached 90,000, these legions consisted mostly not of experienced fighters, but of young men, for most of whom it would be the first battle. Hannibal's army slowly advanced through Apulia. The discontent was growing. Hannibal was lacking money to pay his mercenaries, as well as food to feed his soldiers. That's why he moved his army to a big food stock near the small town of Cannae on the Aufid River. At the end of July the Carthaginian army pitched a camp here. The Romans arrived at Cannae a few days later. They pitched two camps. After seeing this, Hannibal sent the Numidians on a reconnaissance mission. Light Numidian cavalry attacked the Romans who went to the river to get some water. Only by a miracle the Romans were able to reach the camp. Roman cavalry went out to face the Numidians. But the Numidians avoided a direct fight. They were throwing javelins at the Romans and retreated every time the Romans cavalry tried to attack. Nevertheless, the Roman cavalry was able to push the Numidians back to the Carthaginian camp. This made the Romans believe that the enemy riders are cowards and they could easily be defeated in battle. Hannibal knew both the size of the Roman army and its tactics. He studied the area and developed a plan for the future battle. On August 1st of 216 BC he lined up his army for battle. On this day Emilius Pauls was in charge of the Roman army. According to Roman tradition, when two consuls led the army, they commanded it on alternate days. Pauls refused to risk a battle and commanded the army to remain in the camps. More than that, he was planning to move camps to a safer place on the hills near the town, to explore the area and to wait for more favorable conditions for battle. Varro, the other consul, as well as Roman soldiers, were enraged by this decision. The next day, on the 2nd of August, Varro was in charge of the army. He commanded the army to leave the camps and prepare for battle. Emilius Paulus had no other choice but to join Varro. Hannibal also lined up his forces. The Romans hoped that natural obstacles would nullify Carthaginian advantage in cavalry, which was a decisive factor in the battles of the Ticino River and Trebia. At the same time, they thought that battle in the open field would make impossible ambushes Hannibal had used at Trebia and the Lake Trezimeno. They thought that would be a usual proper battle. A fierce infantry attack in the center, splitting the enemy army apart and finishing up the remnants of the Carthaginian troops. The cavalry was only needed to fight the Carthaginian cavalrymen and prevent them from attacking the Roman infantry flanks. Since the advantage in the infantry was overwhelming, the Romans had no doubts about the victory. Roman generals lined up 55,000 heavily armed legionaries, 9,000 lightly armed velites, and 6,000 cavalrymen. On the right flank, Varro placed 2,000 Roman equites, led by Emilius Paulus. On the left flank, there were 4,000 allied cavalrymen led by Varro himself. The core of the army consisted of maniples of heavily armed legionaries. Their formation was narrower and deeper than usual. Intervals between maniples were also shortened. As a result, the Roman formation was a massive deep phalanx. In front of the heavy infantry, there were velites wearing bows, arrows and javelins. A few thousand allied infantrymen were left to protect the camps and as a reserve. Hannibal lined up almost all his forces. He only left a few hundred soldiers to protect the camp. His army formation resembled that of the Roman army. Cavalry on the flanks, infantry in the center. 
On the left flank, near the river, he put 8,000 heavily armed riders, led by his brother Hasdrubal. On the right flank, there were 2,000 Numidian riders, led by Hanno. Hannibal split his infantry into three squads. Two of them consisted of heavily armed battle-hardened African mercenaries. There were 6,000 soldiers in each. Hannibal placed them on the flanks. The central section was formed from Iberian and Gaul warriors. In front of his infantry, he placed archers, javelin throwers and slingers. African mercenaries wore Roman armor and used Roman weapons captured at the Lake Trasimeno. Therefore, it was difficult for the Romans to distinguish them from their own people. Iberians and Gauls used their own weapons. The Iberian swords were the same length as Roman ones, and they could use them for both cutting and thirsting at the close range. The Gauls used long swords, which allowed them to reach even farther. Hannibal combined Iberians and Gauls into one phalanx to complement each other and to efficiently counter the Roman legion's attack. Hannibal realized that the Iberians and Gauls would not be able to fight in a tight formation for a prolonged time due to their lack of experience and training. In the battle, these tribes relied on a single impetuous onslaught. If it failed, their morale lowered quickly. That's why he himself led the central phalanx to increase their morale and combat readiness. Hannibal's plan was to lure the Romans into a trap, encircle and eliminate them. The Carthaginian heavy cavalry had to crush the Roman cavalry and then outflank the Romans. The light Numidian cavalry had to engage the Roman allied cavalry, distract them from the battlefield and prevent them from coming to the aid of the Roman infantry. The Iberians and Gauls had to withstand the fierce strike of the Roman phalanx. The Africans on the flanks had to strike the Romans at the right moment and together with the cavalry encircle them. And finally, the battle horns roared over the field of Canae. The armies moved towards each other. The skirmishers from both sides were the first ones to enter the fight. Javelins, arrows and sling bullets darkened the sky. The phalanxes marched towards each other holding their shields above their heads. At the last moment, the skirmishers retreated to the flanks and rear, clearing the way for heavy infantry. At the same time, the cavalry squads led by Hasdrubal and Emilius Poles entered the battle. Their fight was especially fierce and bloody. The cavalry had almost no room for maneuver. From one side they were limited by the river, and from the other by marching infantry. It was impossible to turn around. Riders were dismounting, dragging their enemies to the ground and fighting there. The brutal and bloody fight didn't last for long. The heavy Carthaginian cavalry pushed back the Romans and forced them to retreat. Consul Emilius Poles was wounded by a sling bullet at the very beginning and joined the infantrymen. On the other flank, the Numidians also entered the stand against the Roman allied cavalry. They were doing what they knew best. They were coming close to the enemy, threw javelins at them and immediately retreated. This hit-and-run tactic allowed Roman cavalry neither to engage the opposing cavalry in a melee fight nor to ignore them and come to the infantry's aid. Tens of thousands of feet raised a lot of dust from the sunburned soil of the field of Canae. A strong wind blew this dust into the eyes of the Roman infantry. Hannibal, of course, studied the directions of the winds in the area before the battle and accounted for it when developing a battle plan. The wind slowed down the Roman javelins and arrows and deflected them from their targets. Meanwhile, the Carthaginian arrows and spears thrown on wind flew farther and hit harder. Because of the dust cloud, the Romans did not notice how the formation of the Iberian Gaul phalanx had changed. Hannibal moved its central part forward, so that now it had the shape of an arc directed towards the opposing army. This formation, according to the Carthaginian general's calculations, would help the Iberians and Gauls to last longer against the Roman onslaught. The Roman legions finally met the Carthaginian arc. The battle instantaneously became very violent and bloody. The fearless Iberians and Gauls were resisting the heavy onslaught of the Romans. Hannibal himself was among them, encouraging them and keeping their morale up in this uneven fight. Legionaries were already walking over the corpses of fallen enemies and compatriots. Their onslaught seemed unstoppable. The Iberians and Gauls were not trained to maintain a tight formation. They were attacking the advancing Romans like waves, but could not break the Roman wall of shields. Step by step, 
the legionaries were breaking through the Carthaginian phalanx. The arc of the Carthaginian infantry first became a line and then started to bend in the opposite direction. In the center, the Roman onslaught was the strongest. On the flanks, they met fierce opposition from the experienced African infantry. That's why they slowly started to move towards the center where there was the least resistance. Meanwhile, Hasdrubal finally drove away the remnants of the Roman cavalry and gathered his riders at the Roman's rear to perform the next step of the plan. The Roman allied cavalry on the opposite flank also started to flee. The strong wind was not calming down. It was blowing right into the Romans' eyes. The dust reduced their ability to see what was happening on the battlefield. More and more often, the legionaries started to act guided by the actions of the masses. They moved where the majority was moving, without even seeing what was ahead. The onslaught of a huge number of Roman infantry on the decimated Iberian Gulf phalanx was getting stronger and stronger. And finally, at some point, the Carthaginian phalanx broke down and started hastily retreating. The whole arc of the Carthaginian infantry moved back. Romans started to chase them, believing that it was a decisive moment in the battle and that the victory was just around the corner. They were right about the first, but not about the second. All their masses moved where they did not meet any resistance, from flanks to the center and forward. They saw nothing but the backs of the fleeing enemies and did not pay any attention to the ranks of warriors advancing from the flanks. The dust prevented them from seeing they were the enemies, as they were wearing Roman armor after all. By the time the Romans realized that they were facing a new enemy, it was already too late. Two squads of heavily armored African mercenaries entered the battle. The Romans stopped chasing the fleeing Iberians and Gauls and turned back to protect their flanks. The Roman army was entrapped and encircled by the Carthaginians from three sides. The Romans won the first clash, but the battle was not won yet. And now, tired after the fierce fight, they faced a new, fresh and vigorous enemy. Just at this time, in the Romans' rear, cavalry led by Hasdrubal and Hanno attacked the infantry on the flanks and in the center. This caused panic and chaos in the Roman ranks. The Carthaginian cavalry finished the job. The encirclement became complete. The whole Roman army was trapped. The legionaries were forced to form a circle and defend themselves from all sides. Consul Emilius Pauls stayed with his army till the end and fell in the battle. Varro, who commanded the Allied cavalry, was able to retreat. Without their generals, there was a total loss of control in the Roman army. Nobody gave orders. Nobody could save the encircled soldiers. The Carthaginians were pressing on from all sides. The Romans were fighting for their lives and trying to break through the lines of the enemy, but there was no way out. They were so crowded together that the legionaries in the middle of the army could not even raise their weapons. The encirclement was getting tighter and tighter. The Carthaginians were covering the field of Canaia with the bodies of their enemies. The battle was a total disaster for the Romans. A few small groups of Roman soldiers were lucky enough to break through and escape where the encirclement was the weakest in the rear. The massacre continued till the night, until almost all the Romans were killed. More than 50,000 Romans fell on the battlefield, 14,000 were captured, and 16,000 escaped. Most of them were those who were left to guard the camps. Never before, and never since, have the Romans suffered such huge losses in one battle. The Carthaginian army also suffered significant losses. Although their losses were much smaller than those of the Romans, they were still in the enemy country and couldn't expect any reinforcement. Around 4,000 Gauls, 1,500 Iberians and Africans, and around 200 cavalrymen fell in the battle on the Carthaginian side. They were three times more wounded. This decisive victory and the destruction of the Roman army gave Hannibal the opportunity to march on Rome once again. But the Carthaginian general, once again, did not use it. There were a number of reasons for that. We'll probably discuss them in a separate video. The Battle of Cannae was the most impressive victory of Carthage in the Second Punic War. But this battle was also the last major success of Hannibal's army. Even in such circumstances, the Romans were able to recover from the defeat, consolidate the whole Republic and fight the enemy tooth and nail. The war lasted for many years and finally ended on the field of Zama, where Hannibal 
led his army into battle for the last time in his life.